The 1980s were a time of significant change for Japan. After World War II, the Allies implemented severe reforms and tariffs that heavily restricted the growth of the Japanese economy, leaving the state of Japan's industries a shadow of their former selves. Over the course of the next few decades, however, these restrictions would gradually be removed, allowing Japan to expand their production levels and re-enter global trade corporations. By the 80s, the Japanese economy hit an all-time high, with unemployment levels being at their lowest in decades and wages at their highest. This peak in national business was substantiated with the rising levels of technology manufacturing and consumption among the public, which in turn led to major social and cultural changes. With increasing levels of personal income, Japan's entertainment industry was now able to thrive and experiment far more than in previous decades, leading to many passion projects entering production. These works frequently challenged traditional Japanese values, and as such became quite popular among younger generations, who saw themselves inhabiting an entirely different nation than that of their parents, which promoted even further shifts among cultural attitudes. And in 1988, the film Akira would further encapsulate this newfound sense of identity Japan was now experiencing. Directed by Katsuhiro Otomo, who also wrote the manga series the movie was based on, Akira invokes the sense of change and uncertainty toward the future Japan faced after the Second World War, as well as the then-contemporary daunting transition into modernism during the 80s. This amalgamation of different turning points in Japanese history can be seen in the film's setting of Neo-Tokyo, a crime-ridden military dystopia rebuilt after Japan was nearly destroyed years earlier at the beginning of World War III. The main plot of the film begins when Tetsuo, a member of a delinquent biker gang, has a run-in with the mysterious child on the run from the military. This encounter unlocks an incredible power within Tetsuo, who upon realizing his newfound abilities, sets out on a destructive rampage across the city, proclaiming himself a god. In response to this, various factions throughout Neo-Tokyo seize this opportunity to push their own agendas. Tetsuo's friend Kanada wants to stop him from wreaking havoc. The military wants to control him and harness his power for themselves. The citizens worship him as a religious savior, and the children that accidentally gave him his power want to prevent him from freeing a powerful man named Akira, who they believe will end the world once awoken. The underlying themes of each of these perspectives serve as allegories to the differing outlooks Japan faced in the closing days of World War II. A government once thought to be invincible now finds itself dealing with the emergence of a horrifying new power that cannot be stopped or protected against. Meanwhile, everyday citizens struggle to adjust to a world where humanity is now aware of this power and what implications this has for the future. What's more, the government's fear that Tetsuo will prevent Japan from hosting the upcoming 2020 Olympics mirror similar sentiments to the hosting of the actual 1964 Olympics, which were seen as proof that Japan had recovered from the war. But while World War II imagery serves as a more explicit backdrop, Akira goes even further by drawing parallels with Japanese history in the years since. After the war, many children were left without parents or much authority at all. This led to many teens seeking community and connection elsewhere, sometimes even joining crime gangs. Likewise, the youth of the 80s was seen as disrespectful and rebellious by their elders. Akira combines these two generations of supposedly misguided adolescents within the main characters of Canada and Tetsuo. Both are impulsive and aggressive teenagers whose parents are implied to be deceased, or at least absent from their lives. They are scolded and dismissed by the adults around them and frequently engage in criminal activity. But what's interesting is that both adults and teens can see themselves within these characters. Older audiences might relate to their lack of direction and struggle to find themselves in the real world, while younger viewers identify with the rebellion and glamour of living without discipline or supervision. And finally, there's how the world of Akira depicts science and technology not as something to be proud of, but rather something to fear and be cautious toward. Nearly every piece of machinery and equipment in the film is shown to be dirty, dangerous, and even somewhat disturbing. Very rarely in the film does the use of modern technology bring about anything positive to the characters, and in most cases, it just makes things worse. This outlook can be attributed to how traditional Japanese culture considers all form of nature to be sacred, and that industrialization must be controlled in order to prevent unnecessary corruption of the world. A belief that was only bold in following the use of atomic bombs, which not only devastated the ecosystem they were deployed at, but also left a vital mark on Japanese society. Science can bring about great positive change, but also bring about horrific consequences. However, the 80s saw Japan's culture shift rapidly toward a much more embracing perspective of scientific advancement. This enlightened more progressive citizens, but for those that still remembered the war's fallout, 
it only concerned them for the direction their country was moving in. Akira released in 1988, at the precipice of Japan becoming the nation it is today. And while things have mostly worked out so far, the film's themes still stand as a reminder that one should always remember where they've been and be careful and pay attention to where they're heading.